So good evening, everyone. Uh, and I wanna thank you for joining us for tonight's program, uh, which is a public conversation with R.A. Judy on his new book, Sentient Flesh, Thinking in Disorder, Poesis in Black. My name is Corey Walker. I'm the Wake Forest Professor of the Humanities at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I wanna thank you uh, again for joining us. And I wanna thank our partners for sponsoring tonight's program. I dearly want to thank uh, partners Dean Franco and the Wake Forest University Humanities Institute, the National Endowment for the Humanities, my colleagues in the Department of English and in the program and in and the program in interdisciplinary humanities, the Slavery, Race, and Memory Project, and the Center for Research for the Center for Research and Engage the Center for Engagement and Collaboration in African American Life that's headed up by Derek Hicks. Tonight's conversation will feature a dialogue between myself and R.A. Judy. Uh, we'll talk a bit about his intellectual formation. Then we'll move to some ideas uh, that help set the stage for sentient flesh. We'll pay, some, we'll pay particular attention uh, to his work with the Boundary 2 Collective uh, and his uh, groundbreaking book of 1994, Disforming the American Canon, African Arabic Slave Narratives and the Vernacular. So let me begin by introducing uh, Professor Judy. R.A. Judy is Professor of Critical and Cultural Studies in the Department of English at the University of Pittsburgh and a member of the Boundary 2 Editorial Collective. He authored the groundbreaking book, Disforming the American Canon, the Vernacular of African Arabic American slave narrative. Um, I think that's a little bit, bit wrong. It is African Arabic slave narratives and the vernacular. If you haven't gotten a copy of this book, please make sure you get it. He's published his published scholarships, scholarship spans multiple fields, from Arabic literature and Islamic thought to critical race theory and black studies. He has, uh, he has edited a number of important dossiers uh, by, and published in the Boundary, published by Boundary 2, including the Tunisia dossier from 2012 and the 2002 uh, dossier, Sociology Hesitant, W.E.B. Du Bois's Dynamic Thinking. He's the recipient of numerous prestigious awards, including two Mellon Scholarship uh, Fellowships, a Ford Foundation Minority Fellowship and a Fulbright Scholarship um, for work that he undertook in Tunisia. His latest book, once again, is Sentient Flesh, Thinking in Disorder, Poesis in Black. And it was published at, by Duke University Press in 2020. So let's welcome R.A. Judy. Welcome, Ron. Thank you, Corey. Thank you very much for a, a generous such a generous uh, introduction. I, I want to thank you for inviting me to this dialogue. I'm looking forward to having it. And I want to thank the, uh, the Humanity Center at Wake Forest for, for making this, this occasion possible. I mean, for you and me, it's two old, two old buddies sitting down and talking, which you do all the time, that they give us such a venue is quite important so we can invite others into our conversation. So thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, thank you. It's so good to see you. And last time we were uh, talking uh, in person, we were uh, in Providence. <laughs> yes, that's right. That was some time ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe some of those stories will come back this evening, but. Some time ago and for you some institutions ago. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I keep moving around, but I think I've found a place to stay. Um, I wanna talk, I wanna begin our conversation uh, really talking about your intellectual formation. Um, I noticed uh, recently you've given uh, an oral history, an oral history interview uh, about your time growing up in Minneapolis. And in that interview, you really talk about the formative figures in your family that really uh, shape and inform uh, your thinking and your orientation to the world and the ways in which uh, you begin to cognate uh, existence. Talk to us a bit about that background, and I want you to really highlight your relationship to granddaddy. <laughs> first, let me uh, 
contextualize that, that interview. I think it's rather important. The uh, person who runs the project, Turtle Creek, Annie Winkler, is really an extraordinary uh, uh, historian in the, in the Twin Cities. And she launched a project to try and create an archive of, 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 of interviews with uh, uh, leftist activists going as far back as she could, 1960s and 70s, up until the moment. And in the course of that, that project, uh, she kept coming across my name. Uh, uh, and, and my name kept coming up with respect to something that was known for a long time as the Washburn Riots, named after Washburn High School. <clears throat> and so she reached out to me in uh, 2016 to ask me to do, uh, do, uh, do an interview. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, I responded and we sat down and we did an oral interview that she, she recorded. And then a whole series of events took place between 2016 and 2020, where, where I wasn't able to actually edit the interview she gave me. Frankly, I was in Greece and I lost it and then I just got very busy. And I also had some trepidations about the, the project itself because I have certain qualms about the form, the autobiographical form specifically. And this is important for the question that you're, you're asking me. So then uh, 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 George Floyd happened. And uh, um, needless to say, a number of my uh, childhood friends with whom I'm still readily in contact with were, were involved uh, in, the, in the protest, uh, including my niece. But also they had been involved in the activism on the ground in Minneapolis ongoing for some decades. That was their work. And she reached out to me and she said, we have to do this interview now because the young people uh, on the ground who are doing this work now need to know this history. And that was a plea that I could not disregard. But I had a very specific project with this interview given my serious qualms about the autobiographical form. And that project was really twofold. Uh, uh, one, of course, to set the record straight about the so-called Washburn riots, and they have their own history uh, in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, and it was in the press, and, and it was history that reflected the, the polarities of, of the moment, 1970 through 1973. But in setting that record straight, there was a second thing I wanted to do, and that was to offer a careful portrait of the intellectual milieu in which I was formed. Not just my intellectual formation, but here was a general milieu and there was a, a vast array of institutions of civil society. There was a vast network uh, committed to the transmission of certain kinds of knowledge and modes of survival from one generation to the other that I and people I grew up with, Daryl Boudreaux, Brian Heron, uh, uh, Prince Nelson were the beneficiaries of it. And I wanted to give as deep and careful a description of that milieu or depiction of that milieu as possible in order to establish that when we arrived at Washburn High School or Ramsey Junior High School, which fed into Washburn, which were two elite schools in, in elite sections of South Minneapolis that were college preparatory schools and did not have a, a, a history of having black students. In fact, we were only the second cohort and we were subject to continual violence from, from, from seventh grade all the way to high school. So I wanted to show that when we arrived at the gates of, of, of those schools, we arrived well formed with a deep intellectual tradition behind us. We were already scholars. Uh, to counter the, the perception of us and myth about us as, as you know, gangsters and, and uninformed and rabble rousers. Right? So the story that I give there about my formation is meant to be uh, really heuristic, exemplary. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is why I talk about important things like the Masonic uh, uh, temple to which my mother's father granddad belonged. He was a Shriner, but also the Elks Club, uh, the way on North Minneapolis, the important role that Mahmoud al Kati played as an exemplary instructor and a bunch of other institutions and processes we were involved in. Now, what I'd say about my grandfather in that story was also meant to offer up an account of the international depths of the, the milieu in which I grew up. So the story I said, and I'm going to give you a brief summary of it. Well, it had its specificities to my family, 
there were other people who had comparable stories of international background. My, my granddad was born in, in the French Quarter of New Orleans. His father was born in San Luis de Santiago de Cuba. And his mother was a free person of color uh, from New Orleans. Uh, um, um, and, you know, they were landowners in, in early in the 19th century. And uh, we have no record whether or not they, they owned slaves, but they belong to that, that ilk, most of whom had come over from Haiti after the successful Haitian Revolution. And he was raised in a Spanish-speaking household. Uh, um, his father, Spanish was his first language. His mother died when he was an infant. And his grandmother, uh, Mari, uh, uh, um, who was from Cuba, uh, raised him. And he was also raised in a household that, that was, in a fundamental way, uh, radical. Um, um, my grandfather was a Garveyite. Uh, he was a Pullman porter. Uh, whenever he talked or he and his cronies would get together, uh, Mr. Boudreau had come up uh, from New Orleans with my grandfather. He had come to Minneapolis because he was a Pullman porter working the railroad. Uh, he came to Minneapolis in 1932. And he used to talk about the Cuban Revolution and he always called it the, the struggle for independence. That was his name for it. And, and his, his, his household, he in that household specifically, uh, uh, was a place where there was continual conversation of the black radical tradition. From old copies of the Brown Book that he kept around for me to look at to sitting on the porch listening to baseball games. Uh, uh, he introduced me to Tony Oliva because of course my grandfather was very proud of his, his, Cuban, his Cuban heritage. To uh, uh, introducing me to the work of Lerone Bennett, to introducing me to the work of, of, uh, of Marcus Garvey in a very subtle, quiet way. Yeah. We just say, here, you need to read this. <laughs> you know, that was, that was his mode. As well as being very proud of, of his, his family story and tradition, which he passed on to his children, my mother and her brother, my uncle, Floyd, and to, uh, to me, anyone who would listen. And I was a curious child and I asked questions. And that family lore was that his father, who was from Cuba, Eduardo, we called him Edward, his father had come to Cuba from the Spanish Sahara, and his name was Mansur, which was the family's original name. So he was always very proud of that, and he 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 would show me this this scrap of Arabic writing uh, that I still have. At the time, as a child, I didn't know what it was. It was just a sense of you know, this is your this is your heritage. You should be proud of it, you know, as well as being very proud of his his Cuban heritage. As a child growing up in the 1960s, and my grandfather died in 1973. Um, um, it was not a time where there was a general pride of, of Latino heritage or even knowledge of it. There were a few of us, uh, 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 Cortez Woodson, uh, Benito Martinez, uh, who had fathers who, or grandfathers of comparable backgrounds. Uh, but generally, there was no general recognition of what we now call Afro-descendientes or even Latinos. So I wasn't very proud of being Cuban. <laughs> at all. Uh, uh, they made me take Spanish in school because of, because of all of this. And I used to uh, uh, rebel by, by cursing my elders whenever they were asking me what I had learned in Spanish. And in my youthful foolishness, uh, I cursed him once. Because when I say youthful, I mean, they would always tell me, and he would tell me where his father was from and that he spoke Spanish. But you know, I was a hard-headed kid. I didn't that mean anything to me. So I foolishly called the man who would know what I was saying the wrong name. And uh, um, that was it. Uh, uh, from 1966 until 73, he never spoke a word to me again in English. And, and a man who generally was very, very quiet was really talkative in Spanish. So there was one point when my Spanish was really very good. And when I went to Howard University uh, in 73, I used to go down to Adams Morgan and I could hang out. Or when I went to visit my cousin Bonnie, uh, in, in East Harlem, I would go down to the bodega and I could hang out. I can still hear, I can still read, but uh, my speaking abilities are, are uh, let's say, rudimentary at, at this point. Well, Granddad was a tremendous impact on me, and he uh, instilled in me uh, a keen sense of, of where I was from. 
And, and, and in that point in time, it was kind of a unique uh, knowledge and it, it, it played a role in, in my subsequent course in life and decisions I made in that he could actually state your, grand, your great grandfather came from here at this time and his father came from here, right? From Spanish Sahara. At the time, it was, you know, a colony of Spain. So there weren't the current municipalities the Moroccan government had put in place. But he would say he belonged to a people called Lud Mansur. And in subsequent trips to Morocco, I've confirmed there in fact are a people called Lud Mansur, uh, who, uh, you know. And so I have, I have, I, I don't think that the family just made those stories up, but even if they did, they were my constitutive and fundamental narrative and my sense of, of, of who I was. Uh, and, and that was important when I made the decision to uh, embrace Islam. Well, you, you, you um, in that story, in that formation, I know we, we've talked a bit uh, extensively uh, about uh, the Masonic and civil society dimensions of it, because these institutions are so formative. Um, but coming out of Minnesota, uh, you gestured to it briefly, you alluded to it rather, uh, to the year you spent at Howard and then uh, your time from Howard, you went over to Cairo. Um, talk to us uh, uh, briefly about that and in your intellectual formation, uh, both at Howard and then moving over into Cairo and what and how that impacted you and helped uh, continue to shape and form your thoughts and ideas. Uh, eventually, you would go on to the University of Minnesota uh, to finish yeah. up your graduate work. Yeah, when I was, uh, you, I'm sorry. Uh, so I was saying, just tell us about uh, Howard and, and Cairo. Yeah, when I was a teenager in, in, in Minnesota, there was a, a childhood friend of mine, a neighbor, James Lawson Jr., we call him the well who uh, had been a member of the Panther Party in, in, in Iowa, in Des Moines, and who came to, back to Minneapolis with the intention of, of starting a chapter uh, in the Twin Cities. And he had drafted a number of us into that venture, and I was one of them. It, the adventure came to a tragic uh, close before uh, the chapter could be created. Uh, he, 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 was, he died in an explosion. But I had been charged with uh, effectively uh, a version of, of, the, of a liberty school. And this is work I continued after uh, his, his, his death. Uh, I secured access to a community center up the street and uh, ran a liberty school. And we studied the usual sort of panther material, which then was France primarily uh, and uh, Mao Zedong primarily. And uh, in the course of that study, and that study work played a role in my political activism, uh, which was publicly you know, marked as the Washburn riot, but I'll just mark that when we move on. But in the course of my studies of Fanon, I became very, very uh, uh, invested in understanding an aspect of the project as he laid it out in, in Wretched of the Earth. And that was the idea of being between two metaphysical camps. And this is 1972. And, and so I, I determined that it was, it was important for me to have a solid formation um, in both uh, uh, Western jurisprudence and Islamic jurisprudence, because those were the two metaphysical camps that Fanon was referring to. And then because of the family story that I had, it was both a politically motivated decision, motivated by my engagement with Fanon's work, and then that family motivated decision, right? So a kind of mixture of of, of, of leftist romanticism and familiar romanticism. This took me to Howard. I, I went to Howard because I wanted to go to a black institution having grown up in Minneapolis, where at the time when I grew up in the city of Minneapolis, we were less than something like 3.4% of the entire population. When I went to Howard and I was among the first class of Tony Brown's then newly established School of Journalism, I went with the intention of going into broadcast journalism. I had been involved in a a media access company that a number of brothers and I got together and made called Real Vision. Now, when I got to Howard, uh, I failed abysmally. I didn't go to class because I got involved uh, um, with the Islamic Party of North America, which was at the time the largest organized Sunni Muslim party in the country, run by uh, Muzaffar Din, 
And I spent all of my time uh, in the mosque engaging in proselytization and, and other issues associated with the political activity of the party. I, I became a member of the, of the chancellery and I was the design artist for the, uh, the party's newspaper called El Aslam. So the year I spent at Howard, I really spent <laughs> in the streets of Northwestern University <laughs> and uh, at the 101 S Street Mosque and going up and down the East Coast in our, our uniforms of, of a green kameez and black sarwal, uh, engaging in the then uh, uh, activist Sunni Muslim politics. I stress that because we were not at all affiliated with the black Muslims in the nation of Islam. Uh, uh, we were in the line of movements like the Muslim Brotherhood and Dar al-Islam, and there were a number of these kind of Sunni movements. One of the things that made the Islamic Party of North America distinct is a large percentage of its members came from uh, leftist movements such as the Panthers and the Portuguese, the, the Puerto Rican Liberation Army. Many of them were either in college or college educated in contrast to the other movements that were working class. Uh, uh, and that gave the Islamic party a very particular flavor. It went on to all kinds of interesting political adventures and, and came to no good end. I was expelled from the party along with two other members and we, we lived together in this commune. Uh, um, uh, and I was expelled from the party for two reasons. One was learning Arabic because Muzaffuddin had dictated to us, none of us should learn Arabic that he was the only source of knowledge we needed to have. And the other was uh, 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 for alleging to want to kill the Imam. That was Muzaffuddin. That came out of a dispute over women's rights. Uh, so when I was expelled from the party, uh, I gravitated towards the Islamic Center of North America, which is the official uh, mosque of the country at that time and uh, became a very good friend of, 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 of Abd al-Rauf, its imam, and Uthman, the assistant imam. And in the course of working with them for about nine months, they encouraged me to apply to Al-Azhar University, a place I had heard, from, heard about from my grandfather. Right? When I accepted Islam, said, you've picked the best religion, and if you really are serious about this, there's this place in Cairo you need to go to called Al-Azhar. So at their encouragement, I applied and uh, I was accepted uh, uh, to Al-Azhar. I took a year's delay in arriving with their permission and I went back to Minneapolis for a year where I did nothing but work, work and study Arabic. I worked as the assistant manager in a Palestinian restaurant uh, and I delivered papers in the morning and I was the night manager in the restaurant and in the daytime I worked at Travelers Insurance and in the meantime, when I wasn't working, I simply was studying uh, Arabic. I had a private tutor. And so I, go to, I went to Cairo, to Al-Azhar in 1975. Now, the important points about this background is there was, there was a very specific leftist foundation and radical leftist foundation and a drift that was very common in the 70s of radicals into, into Sunni Islam really predicated upon that distinction Fanon made between the two metaphysical camps and the notion that if one was seeking to escape the epistemological structures of, of the West, then Islam was, was an option. That, that was the mind frame that, that I had and that my ilk had. And so when I went to Al-Azhar, I went with the intentions of becoming a sheikh, an Islamic scholar. Uh, I ended up being admitted into the uh, uh, College of, 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 of Arabic Language general section where I focused on Arabic literature and Islamic philosophy. And, and that, was, that was my work. And I did that for four years. Uh, uh, a year shy of the degree, I had to go back to uh, Minneapolis uh, 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 because of, of my own failing health. Uh, uh, I had contracted the uh, Lharzia and because my father was dying. So uh, I went back uh, to Minneapolis to, to spend his last, you know, his last few months with him. And it was in that context that I, I transferred the work I had done at the Al-Azhar uh, uh, into the University of Minnesota, uh, where I was able to create a BFIL program on Islamic philosophy, uh, supervised by the, the, the great uh, uh, Arabic scholar Anwa Shehni, uh, who was a specialist in the work of Ibn, of Ibn Rushd and others. Uh, 
and then also by Brennan Terrell, uh, who is my uh, logical positivist anchor, as it were, from Minnesota's perspective. And uh, I completed that degree uh, um, um, in pretty short order. I got back to Minneapolis uh, at the very end of, of uh, 79. So I was in Egypt from 75 to 79. And I completed my undergraduate degree in 81. Uh, um, I completed in 81 when I was in France, because in the meantime, I had gotten married and, and my wife had taken a job at the faculty, uh, at the faculty in, in, in Pau in the Southwest of France. And I completed my BPhil there and defended uh, there and uh, got my degree in Islamic uh, philosophy with the intention of staying in France, but that didn't work out. So we came back to Minnesota. And when I came back to Minnesota, uh, I applied to the program of comparative literature, primarily because the kind of philosophy that I wanted to do, which was uh, uh, hermeneutics, uh, uh, Heideggerian hermeneutics, uh, was, 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 there were very few programs in the country that were willing to entertain that kind of work. One of them being Duquesne, another being Dupont. Uh, and so, um, um, at that time, critical theory was growing in, in comparative literature departments. And in fact, that philosophical work had migrated literally over into the seminars that Vlad Godzic was, was conducting uh, in complex, like enrolled in complex. And that's when I got to study with Derrida, with the Gambin, with Lyotard, because these are the people that Godzic brought in. Right. Weber was part of the faculty there. Meda Ben Samaya was uh, one of my advisors. And, uh, and, and that's when I took the degree in comparative literature. I did both an MA, an MA and a PhD. The MA was a, a piece on, on uh, Islamic lexicography, a very specific Arabic lexicon. And the PhD was what became this for me, the American canon. That's where I want to uh, pay attention. Um, you in, a, in the recent Boundary 2 interview uh, with you and uh, Fred, Fred Moten. Um, Fred raised the question, what, what happened to this form in the can? Meaning when it emerges, when it emerged, um, the way that its reception, particularly as it opens up around um, that scene in 1977, the Yale seminar, and what Gates is, is doing at the work at that Yale seminar. You also reference back to the work of Armstead Robinson um, and the Black Studies in the University uh, in 69 and what that meant for the order of knowledge, the structure of knowledge. I wanna ask you, um, in, that, in this forming, you go to the narrative of Ben Ali and the work of Ben Ali in terms of how we begin to think through um, the inability of the structure, the order of knowledge to apprehend or to think of Ben Ali. Talk to us about how you feel this, the reception of, of this text um, really helped to shape and inform uh, your thinking or, or its lack of reception. Um, how, how would you account for that? Um, well, those are, those are two questions related. To two questions, yeah. Two questions. Uh, I'll take the first one. Uh, um, as I said, in 1972, uh, I, I took seriously Fanon's remarks about, about two different metaphysical camps. And when I decided that I wanted to uh, uh, study both Western jurisprudence and Islamic jurisprudence, I had in mind a very specific epistemological project. I thought then, in 72, that the discourse that was going to matter on the world stage in, a, in trying to achieve something like uh, worldwide social justice was going to be the discourse of international law. But any intervention I wanted to make in the discourse of international law, I thought had to be based upon a thorough enough understanding of the epistemological structures and foundations of the Western philosophical tradition and the Islamic philosophical tradition in order to not just do a comparative analysis, but formulate something out of the mix, right? A kind mm -hmm. of uh, uh, epistemic rupture, because I was still very much informed by Fanon. And I want to stress this, that the Fanon I encountered in 
I encountered in relation to the Panthers. I encountered it in the streets. I encountered it among the people. And it's the same fanonism that, that drove the, the movement at San Francisco State for the formation of the first degree ranking program in, in, in Black studies. So disforming the American canon, and I'm getting to the Ben Ali, is, is really the first public articulation of that project. I'm still always working on that specific epistemological project. And in this book, I want to kind of lay the foundations for an epistemic rupture. And in that context, I wanted to ask a set of questions about the presumed nature of consciousness in relationship to literacy that had defined the emerging African-American canon and the presence of Arabic language discourse among the enslaved Africans here. The Ben Ali text was a text that one came across often, right? There's, there's, there's Chandler Harris's story of Ben Ali, which is based on this. And Alan Austin had made an allusion to it in a volume he did on, Afri on, on antebellum. Uh, not antebellum, I guess prebellum. Uh, um, 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 yeah, antebellum. Antebellum, antebellum uh, uh, African, uh, Arabic speaking African slaves. And, uh, and I knew that it was at that time in Georgia and Atlanta. Uh, and so uh, uh, really uh, um, on a whim, I wasn't certain that this text would provide me with ample material to do what I wanted to do epistemologically, but based upon the reports I had read about it, I could imagine it would. So on a whim, I, I and this is when air travel was affordable, so even a grad student could afford a ticket, a round trip ticket down to Atlanta. I went down to Atlanta to see this document. And the document was not being well cared for at the time. Now it's being much better cared for, it's, it's in Savannah. But it was there and the librarian liked me, found me, char found me charming enough. So I was able to, she allowed me to photocopy all of it, actually to photograph it, as well as photocopy all of it, a rather fragile text, but I was very careful with it. And, and, and I was quite pleased to find that it provided more than ample material for what I want. And one of the ways it provided ample material for what I wanted is, is the document itself belied the way it had been characterized by everyone who had written about it, who claimed it was an autobiography. It's not that at all. And it's very clearly not that at all. The people who made this claim, of course, made it because they couldn't read the Arabic and didn't bother to read the Arabic. Some important scholars, which was rather intriguing in that regard. And it also provided information because in the formation of the African-American canon, uh, Skip Gates made a, a big deal of, of Ayub ben, ben Suleiman's uh, having written a letter in Arabic as a foundational text for this literary tradition. This literary tradition referring to the tradition in which the blacks write themselves yeah. into humanity without again paying any attention to what the actual content or style of those documents were, including Ayub bin Suleiman's text. So what I wanted to do and what I did in this book was to do a careful reading of this document in relationship to the canon it was being positioned. And such a reading already showed that that document, those documents, because I talk about Lenin Kibbe's work and you know I discovered there was a whole bunch of those, those slaves who were literate in Arabic were the focus of attention of the American Oriental Society in its early foundations. Uh, so there's a great deal of writing about them. And, and their work, and Ben Ali's text is the longest extant of them that we know, that we know there can indeed be many, many more. But that work really was in tension with the underlying epistemological premises of the canon formation project. It, it not only did it not do, what was being claimed of it. But what it did do challenged the fundamental presumption of, of, of the illiteracy of Blacks in the first place, that they needed to learn letters to become free. They already had letters in the case of these individuals, but also the presumption that they were writing in order to establish their humanity, right? When in fact, the Ben Ali text is, is, is really a meditation in which he sustains a particular attitude of rebellion, if you will. And, and I'm thinking a little bit of Sherman Jackson's notion uh, of, of, of uh, protest appropriation, but it wasn't really that. 
because he's writing from memory sections of a very important uh, Risalat uh, Arwani, which is, uh, was an important Sunni doc document in jurisprudence uh, in, in, in opposition to the then Shia Fatimid imperial structure. So just reciting that document in its circulation was a certain act of sedition. And it was a certain act, act of sedition at the, the theological, at the theological and the juridical level. So that's what he was writing. And he was focusing on sections that had to do with the questions of religious liturgy. That's what he was writing. So that means there's a completely different epistemology going on with this text. And that's what I tried to elaborate in the text and the way in which that different epistemology provides a material expression in contradiction, not only to the project of American canon formation, but also the enlightenment propositions about what it is to be human. So it's the first public expression of this ongoing project. And it's also, in terms of your question about formation, sets me on the path of paying very close attention to material expressions emerging from among black folk, let's say that, right? That are working in accordance with their own very specific structures of knowledge, which are expressed in those forms. And that if we pay attention to those forms, and we take those structures of knowledge seriously and we engage them, then they give us a whole set of, of questions, a whole set of, of approaches to the question about what it is to be human and what it means that in some instances are in opposition to the Western Enlightenment project, but in most instances, in many instances are oppositional to it. And, and you know that still has been the focus of virtually everything I've written uh, up to this point. In each case, I'm trying to to flesh out the, the it's, it's somewhat archeological, but, but the, the material expressions that constitute what could be delineated as a certain kind of radical tradition uh, and, and including attending to their expressions in Africa uh, um, um, without adhering to the distinction of North versus South, as well as their, their traces within the new world uh, to see if, if, if they don't provide us a material for thinking differently, to use Franon's phrase, for, for thinking something else. Our, your, in your um, essay uh, on, in Boundary 2 on sociology hesitant with Du Bois, when we assume that that essay was lost and it was in the papers the whole time, uh, you give an itinerary of thought that goes back to the mid eighties around this, around these ideas. Um, and when I, when I first picked up, and I think I told you this the other day when we were talking, when I first picked up uh, Sentient Flesh, I was reminded of that because you write about this text and I'll read it, I'll read this, these two statements. The principal proposition of Sentient Flesh is that those populations designated and constituted within the political economy of capitalist modernity as Negro enact practices of living, oasis and black, which are not fully comprehensible by the semiosis of the economy, particularly its grammar of ontology. More importantly, however, those practices articulate oppositionally, opening up infinities of other ways of being human in community, becoming, ever becoming. Talk to us a bit about this text and how we are now at that, we arrive at this point in the journey. So you've asked me to connect it to sociology hesitant, which-, which... That, that, was, that was my reflection. All right. <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> but there, there is an important connection. I discovered that text, as it were, in 1985, mm -hmm. right? Because everybody, everybody, yeah. bone, were saying this text is lost. And so I, I was going through the, uh, uh, the, uh, the catalog of the holdings at Amherst, and lo and behold, it appeared there. So I wrote the librarian at Amherst. I still have the letter from, from the librarian at Amherst, 1985. Uh, uh, when I was living on Portland Avenue, saying, does this exist? And you know, then 
people were not paying attention to it. So again, the librarian was very generous and sent me the text. And when I read that text, and I read it as I was reading Du Bois' correspondences, and I had been stuck by the letter that he wrote in 1956 to Her Herbert Aptheker, in which he offers up the uh, asymptotes of the hyperbola analogy, which plays prominent in sentient flesh. But when I read that and I read sociology together, I said, okay, when Du Bois says in his letter to Aptheker in 56 that his entire project has been about exploring this relationship between chance and law, has been about interrogating, right? The, the possibilities of a certain kind of ethics that rest in a certain kind of science of mind. You see this playing out in Sociology Hesitant, which you wrote in response to the 1904 World's Fair, where he's laying out the, the epistem epistemological grounds of his move in sociology, right? So that sets me on a trail, a long trail. And it's a long trail that at the same time in 85 had to do with trying to understand what it is that's problematic about the Negro, right? And what I mean by that and what I meant by that and still mean by it, what is it about the so-called Negro that, that, that so many find repulsive? And in studying the Du Bois material, I began to understand that what was repulsive was precisely here was a population that was in the world without a mythology and without a discourse of origin or, or the need to be able to act based upon a discourse of origins, right? And, and that's a frightening proposition. So I wanted to begin to explore whether or not I was right in that assessment. And I mean explore by paying attention to popular forms of expression, such as the buzzard loaf, such as Juba, but there are many others I've paid attention to in my writing on Negro authenticity on hip hop. Popular forms of expression that indicate, or, or if one is fortunate and pays attention, explicitly articulate a notion of being in community that works on a different grammar than the grammar of the self-possessed property individual, right? The sort of thing that Du Bois reaches for in his, his important three, three talks, right? uh, uh, the Harvard commencement talk and then the two talks at the American Negro Academy. So there is the connection with sentient flesh. Mm -hmm. And of course, obviously with this forming as well. I mean, that's, that's driving this project. There really is a project that's been going on for a long, long time around this question. So in coming to sentient flesh, this project began in a very specific kind of way. It was going to be a collection of, of essays that I had done and some that I had not published that were meditations on this question across different texts in Arabic, in Spanish, in English. And when I was uh, doing this, it was initially uh, uh, um, um, committed to Fordham through uh, Helen Tarter, and then she died tragically. So when her successor took over, he, 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 he said he didn't have an interest in a collection of such essays. So I went back to the drawing board and began to look at the essays I had and said, well, is there a coherent story here? And so what began as a theoretical interlude, which is how I titled it, developed into the 170 pages of the first chapter, which extrapolates out of the reading of, of the coming of John and of sociology hesitant and of Du Bois's unpublished uh, 1889, uh, 90, uh, essay paper, Renaissance of Ethics for William James, extrapolated out of it, and of course, the Aptheker letter, a concept of asymptotic thinking, right? That, 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 that the boys was laying out, was sketching out a certain kind of epistemic trajectory. And so that chapter does the work of, 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 of detailing that trajectory to a certain extent in order to be able to deploy it in the subsequent readings that take place in the text, right? And, 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 and of course, in, in those texts of Du Bois's, there is the insistence on attending to the material expression of the people called black or the people called Negro, right? And the ways in which their articulations are doing, again, in the Fanonian sense, something 
something else. Now, one of the things they're doing that's something else, apropos the passage you read, and, and again, this is coming out of my, my, my engagement with, with the boys, but not just, was a position that was fundamentally not ontological. I mean, the boys in, in various passages expressly opposed to teleology and theology. And this is clear in his Renaissance of Ethics essay. And, and the consequences of that, of course, challenge the grounds and foundations of, of, of ontology. Mm -hmm. so, so that is the, the way into what becomes the long meditation in the text uh, on the question of, of, of ways of, of being that aren't ontological, which, which I'm offering up the ways of being that are semiotic. And they're, they're semiotic in a certain kind of way of confluence, which I call parasemiosis. And this is the, the conceptual distinction uh, that you make between parasemiosis and what Naomi Chandler uh, develops, paraontology. This yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Naomi Chandler and I are, 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 as I say, we're, you know, we're dancing to the same music. We just are, are, are have different movements, yeah. and and the paraontological he's trying to reach for the same thing I'm trying to reach, which is an account of a way of being in common together mm -hmm. that is not reducible, right? that's not reductively universalist, and at the same time is not founded in transcendence. And, and I have to say, there were a series of interesting books that came out when this format came out, which I believe was in 94, I think it was 92. I, mean, 92. Yeah. I may be wrong, but that of course was Paul Gilroy's Black Atlantic, But more importantly, Victor Anderson's, you know, beyond ontological blackness, which was 1995, mm -hmm. which was his response to Cohn's inauguration of liberation theology, which was Cohn's response to the threat he thought, saw being posed by ra radical black secularism embodied in such things as the black power movement, right? So Cohn's effort to offer up a certain kind of Christology. Now, of those three books, is forming Black Atlantic beyond ontological blackness. Only one of them gets a lot of attention and that's Black Atlantic. In certain ways, Sentient flesh is still an engagement with an argument that Anderson opened up, right? I push it further than Anderson does because Anderson is still invested in transcendence. He's still a theologian, right? Yeah. <laughs> Victor, and I don't think Victor would, uh, he, would, he, would he would probably say, no, I'm, I'm not as invested in um, being a theologian. No, but he's definitely invested in transcendence and his whole, his whole investment in, in religious realism mm -hmm. right, marks that. And his notion of, of trying to articulate some kind of discourse, what, what, is, what does Korn call it, uh, 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 democratic? No, he calls it, he, he's doing, um, he's trying to move away from the cult of the heroic genius. Exactly, exactly. So, but in moving away from that cult, to pose up a certain kind of questions of what is the structure of community, right? That informs part of what I'm engaging in in talking about the difference between parasemiosis and paraontology, mm -hmm. right? But the point of departure for me coming out of the Du Bois again is precisely one that is not at all invested in the transcendent, right? It's not about transcendence. And in that sense, it's not teleological and it's not theological. I think you do that uh, early on in sentient. <laughs> throughout. <laughs> that's an important point you make because that's how I earn what I say later on in paraontology, right? Because the real point there is to say that when we look at these things like the buzzard loaf and, and, and Juba, and then I go into questions about, you know, formations of personhood, these people are clearly not engaging in an ontological project. They're not engaging in a critique of the ontological project. They're doing something else. Mm 
right? And it's an order of practice, of living practice, and an order of thinking that somehow needs to be engaged in its terms. Right? And that's, that's, that's the stake in parasemiosis. And of course, also pointing out the extent to which the project of paraontology, even though uh, Naom uh, formulates it in a very particular way, has, has its origins in the work of Oscar Becker, which I don't know if Naom has read him or not. I think that Naom came up with paraontology under his own impetus in the, the kind of reading and attention he was paying. But I wanted to mark the, the conceptual pitfalls involved in, in this engagement with the paraontological, right? Because Becker's paraontology plays a very particular uh, part in maintaining a certain order of primitivism as a way of rescuing the philosophical project away from what he thinks are the, the unmoorings that Heidegger's project uh, sets forth. Now, we, the, the book is titled Sentient Flesh. And just as you with this form in the canon have you know, these readings of Douglas, of Equiano, of uh, Ben Ali, here you talk about this figure of Tom Wyndham and his narrative, but you place that narrative in conversation with your boundary two colleague, Hortense Spillers, and how she uh, develops a conceptual economy of the flesh. Talk to us a bit, uh, Judy, about your turn to or this development of, of the flesh owing to uh, Tom and your conversation with Hortense around uh, this conceptual development. Yeah, so as I say, I'm, I'm interested in trying to attend to ordinary speech in its own terms. So, so Wyndham's remark, us deserve our freedom because us is human flesh, uh, um, I, I read as offering up a, an understanding of, of humanity that really departs from the enlightenment structures. And I try to establish that when I contrast his reading with Douglas. And I wanna understand that. And, and the feminist work of Hortense Spillers, and I want to stress the feminist work of Hortense Spillers offers one of the best ways of understanding that utterance on Wyndham's part, precisely because of the way in which she understands the constitution of the body within the structures, within the dynamics, within the American grammar book, her term, right, of capitalist modernity. So my turn to her is to understand him and to understand him through her, I have to understand her. And one of the remarkable things about Hortense's deep, deep thinking is the work she does with structuralism, in this case, Roland Barthes and the way in which she opens it up to certain prospects that Barth would not have imagined. And so I attend to all of that in order to understand better what's at stake in her conceptualization, not merely of the hieroglyphics of the flesh. Everybody cites Hortense. I wonder how many people really read her, but in her, her notion of vestibularity, right? And, and what that enables us to do. And, and in, in working that through, it, it, it enabled me to say, okay, what Wyndham is talking about here is something that doesn't have to do with the body coming after the flesh or conscience in the, but, but there's a co-articulation. It's yeah. fleshly. It's of the flesh. What kind of, what kind of notion of being is that? Yeah. Right? And, 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 and in the spectrum of sentience, where there's no erasure of the animality, right? What does that mean for how we understand the relationship between intelligence and being? How does it trouble the dominant anthropology? And so Hortense opens up those questions and those questions then go straight into things like the buzzard rope, which are all about the, the assumption of the animal, right? Not merely the mimic, mimicking, but the assumption of the animal. And they belong to, uh, we know, uh, there are whole kinds of iterations across the new world, but also then in the continent of, of these kind of performances that are indicative of a way of understanding what it is to be, what it is to be in collection, in the collective, what it is to be in common, right? And, and so the engagement with Hortense opens up all of that, right? It, it becomes a, a, a guide 
in the reading of, of Wyndham. Right? And, and admittedly, there's a dialectic here. There's a set of questions because you know, there, there are aspects of Fort Dentsu's project that I think Wyndham's utterance pushes up against in a particular way, but in a way that I hope I've shown in the text that is, that is generative. I want to ask you one last question, and it really lend, it really goes to um, your very attentive reading of Du Bois, and particularly uh, of Du Bois and Souls. It seems that when you're reading Souls, not only of the coming of John, but when you um, of our spiritual strivings, that first paragraph that ends with the sentence, to the real question, how does it feel to be a problem? I answer seldom a word. Um, it seems that souls operates almost classically as a, a text of pedagogy. Right? This, this, text is doing some work and it you really draw this out in your reading of in your reading of of the coming of John looking at the reception of souls uh, from folks across the nation when you go through the letters of Du Bois and the letters he received about people reading souls right and they're reading it across time I mean I was going through some of the letters uh, from soon after it's published through up through the 19 teens to look at souls as pedagogy. Is Du Bois, could we think that this text um, is serving that educational um, role, that pedagogical role um, in black community life um, or in black life? That's an interesting question. I'm not sure I can imagine what it would look like if it were to function in such a pedagogical way. Um, um, for a number of reasons. One of it is much of its, its material study, its empirical study, its statistical study is outdated. Uh, it, it, it gives us a, a, a real time snapshot of the emergence of a particular population's consciousness mm -hmm. under certain circumstances. And that indeed is instructive. Uh, and, and, and I guess in that sense, it is pedagogical. Uh, I see it as being an important historical record that, that, that shows us the dynamics of formation. And that in the way it shows us the dynamic of formation, of formation is, is is attentive to those dynamics. It doesn't write over them, yeah. which is why there's this kind of interesting unevenness or as he talks about the stylistic variation because what's going on is dynamic and uneven and he wants to, to record it. That's instructive. That teaches us something about historical formation. It may teach us something about historical formation of any populations that are, are, are brutalized in such a way that they're left with the fundamental elements of the imagination and so it teaches, a, teaches us what humans can do. And in that sense, yes, it's, it's, it's a pedagogical text very much like the Iliad is in that it, it, it displays, doesn't just talk about, but it displays the capacity and power of poetic imagination. And I mean the imagination to create ourselves. So, so I would be willing to think about it as being pedagogical in that sense, which is pretty much how I try to talk about it in sentient flesh, right? which is to say, it's not just a, a, a record of, okay, here's black people who've created these things. It, it is that, but it's also saying, so here's a population that just came out of the most abject conditions that have devastated the usual structures of social normalcy and look at what they're doing, almost out of whole cloth. The simple fact of that tells us something about the human condition, right? If we recognize that these are humans, they're saying something about what human beings can do under the most adverse circumstances, under the circumstances of complete groundlessness, without having a mythology, without having a foundation, and yet they're able to create church, civil institutions, family structures, to, to present notions of the future and communal formation. So yeah, in that sense, it's, it's fundamentally uh, um, 
um, pedagogical of the human condition. It, it's, it's a wonderful lesson of, of, again, poetic creativity. Well, Ronald, um, I wanna thank you for uh, continuing uh, our close to two decades long conversation tonight. I know there's so much more. I have uh, colleagues from uh, University of Richmond, Winston-Salem State. Of course, Jay Carter and I talked about this. Uh, colleagues from University of Oslo, uh, Dean Franco and, and his colleague, Bruce Barnard, they're wrestling with your text uh, between Wake Forest and Oslo. Um, so I wanna thank you for uh, helping us uh, and offering us this gift. And it really is a, a generous text. And it, it's not only generous, it is generative of thought. Um, and you leave with a question, I wanna leave us with a question um, that you, you put on page 293 in your section on, I, I titled it Du Bois Between James, Purse, and Royce. Mm. Um, and I really appreciated you uh, uh, bringing in uh, Royce um, and Royce on community, because we know that this idea of community, beloved community, will, whereas Royce is hesitant about church um, uh, structures, it'll become baptized by King uh, as the, pre uh, the exemplary formation of the church as broader society. And Royce is one of the fundamental figures that Du Bois wrestles with in that book. Yeah. Royce becomes the only professor who writes on race. Race questions and other provincialism. Um, but you're right, who can speak for the human? And from where does the authority to do so come from? That's a question for all of us to continue to ponder and to engage and to continue to study. Thank as you. Usual, as usual, you leave me with the provocation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope I've been of some use. I think you've been of tremendous use. Um, and once again, thank you for the gift of friendship. Thank you for the gift of your mind. And thank you for spending time with us this evening and talking to us about sentient flesh. I want to wish everyone good night. Thank you for joining us. And we'll look forward to continuing the conversation uh, at another moment.